Let's talk about James Graham. No, not the pop singer, the original. James Graham, better known as the Marquess of Montrose, or even simply Montrose, was a complex figure in Scottish history. A man with a very tattered past. Some have called him a traitor, others a national hero. No one could deny, though, that Graham was a courageous man whose pragmatic views led him on a difficult path that spanned many bloody battlefields. James Graham was born in 1612. Historians place his birth sometime around October. When he was only 14, his father passed away and young James inherited the earldom of Montrose. As a young man, Graham traveled across Europe pursuing his calling, that of becoming a professional soldier. History would prove he was an able student. Young Graham's first taste of combat came with the so-called Bishop's Wars. This complicated conflict resulted from attempts by King Charles I of England to impose the Anglican faith on Scotland by installing new bishops. This persecution of religious freedom angered the Scots greatly and led in 1638 to the movement known as the National Covenant. Now, the Covenant was a grand promise to defend Scotland's Presbyterian religion against Charles. The men who signed the Covenant, known as Covenanters, were basically declaring open rebellion. James Graham, Earl of Montrose, was among them. The Covenanters' leader was Archibald Campbell, 8th Earl and 1st Marquess of Argyll. Campbell was very popular and rabidly anti-royalist. Graham was one of his most able commanders, responsible for the capture of key strongholds around Aberdeen. Graham was with the Covenanter army when it invaded and occupied Northern England in 1640. However, Graham was not a true believer in the cause. He felt personally that the Covenant should come to an end if Charles removed the bishops. Like many other Scottish nobles, Graham wanted religious freedom, but did not want the Presbyterians as sole rulers of the state, which seemed to be Campbell's end goal. With many others, Graham signed the Bond of Cumbernauld, a document stating these concerns. Some see this as an early example of the concept of separation of church and state. Well, in the short term, it got Graham arrested for conspiracy and thrown in prison in 1641. Graham sat in prison from June through November. He was only freed when Charles finally removed his bishops from Scotland, ending the war. It's critical to note that Charles I's actions in Scotland were a major precursor of the English Civil War, also known as the War of the Three Kingdoms, since England, Scotland, and Ireland were all involved. This epic conflict between the English Parliament and the King would end with Charles losing his head. In 1644, Covenanters invaded England to fight alongside the Parliamentarians, led by Oliver Cromwell. Was Graham with them this time? No, because it was King Charles himself who recruited him. The man who had once supported the rise of the Earl of Campbell and the Covenanter regime now went to war against them. Charles made him his lieutenant general and named Graham first Marquess of Montrose. In August of 1644, Montrose had begun to raise an army of Highlanders and Irishmen, anyone he could find. His forces gained an important ally in the person of Alistair Macaulay. Macaulay's clansmen helped Montrose win one of his first major battles at Topermuir in September of 1644. During this battle, Montrose found himself outmanned and outgunned, a situation he would find himself in many times in future battles. However, Graham used superior tactics. McCullough's large brigade took the center of the field while Montrose sent his Highlanders to flank both sides. Then Montrose's cavalry raced ahead at the last second drawing enemy fire. The resulting confusion allowed his infantry to overtake the enemy. Less than two weeks later, Montrose faced down the Covenanter army again at Aberdeen. He called for their surrender, but they refused, so Montrose prepared for attack. The Covenanter army had called up local forces to boost their defenses, but it was not enough. The two armies clashed on the field with Montrose and McCullough leading the center. Despite being a larger force, the Covenanters' inexperience made them no match for Montrose's veterans. The battle ended in a bloodbath. After the victory, Montrose's army pillaged the town. Some historians speculate that he was trying to set an example for the other Covenanters. Montrose seemed unstoppable. Often despite bad odds and bad ground, his tactical genius won the day. Through 1645, his victories kept coming. Inverlochy in February, Aldern in May, Alford in July, Kilsyth in August. After these monumental victories, King Charles presented Montrose with the titles Lieutenant Governor and Captain General of Scotland. However, all these phenomenal successes would count for naught. Even as Montrose was winning in Scotland, 
the Royalist forces were being hammered in England, and most famously were decimated at the Battle of Naseby. This loss crushed both armies and morale, even as far away as Scotland. You see, most of Montrose's army had joined up not because they believed in the Royalist cause, but because they hated the Covenanters. Sensing defeat, they began to disperse. Campbell's forces finally defeated Montrose at Philippa. And in the end, Graham himself had to flee to Norway. Now, was it over for Montrose? Not quite. Many years later, the late king's son, Charles II, would give Montrose his blessing and 1,200 men to help win back Scotland. But fortune did not smile on the expedition. A shipwreck dwindled much of Montrose's forces, leaving him at a severe disadvantage when he landed. He was soundly defeated at Carbisdale after only a month in Scotland. Wounded and wandering on his own, Montrose sought refuge with the MacLeods of Assent. However, the MacLeods had had clan members on both sides of the conflict, and in the end, they surrendered Montrose for the reward money. Montrose, having no support or men left, was taken to Edinburgh to be hanged. He claimed until his last breath that he was both a real covenanter, fighting to keep the Presbyterian religion safe, as well as a loyal subject of the crown. After his hanging, they mutilated his body and sent the pieces out to different cities in the country. Eleven years on, a successful and popular King Charles II ordered Montrose's remains gathered and given a proper burial. You could see this as a bit cynical, however, since Charles himself had always denied ever having employed Montrose in the first place. So was Montrose a traitor or was he a hero? Regardless of how you see his individual actions, it's hard to deny that he was a really great leader of men and a clever warrior on the battlefield. If you want to learn more about Montrose and his world, check the description below for some links to some books. In the meantime, we hope you enjoyed this video, and we hope you'll check out the other content we've done on Scottish history. Have a great day.